Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Lord's Day at the Antioch Bible Church, Alamo, Texas. Glad to have you here. And uh, it's good to see that uh, we got a pretty good turnout so far. And we'll have a few more drop in here in a little bit. Looking forward to that. And uh, we're here to give glory and honor to our Lord for what great things he's done for us. So if you'll stand with me and we'll sing our little uh, invocation song on the back of your hymn, on the back of your bulletin, uh, just a closer walk with thee. I'll wait for the piano to get started here. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the long wait. Good imagination. We're looking to Marita coming back pretty soon. Just a closer walk with thee. Bread in Jesus, it's my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Our first song this morning, number 475, I Redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercies. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus. No language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of His presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. Redeem his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem. Redeem, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me fires in the night. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem. Redeem, his child and forever I am. Father, first of all, we thank you this morning that we have been, been privileged to be redeemed. We thank you so much for the blood of that lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. For Father, by it is by that blood that we have truly been redeemed. The price has been paid for our sins and our iniquities. And Father, for this we are eternally grateful. And we beg, Father, for forgiveness for those many years that we walked in vanity and pride, caring not that for us Jesus had been crucified. But Father, we thank you that you have opened our eyes and they have, we have seen the truth. And now we can sing with joy in our hearts that we have been redeemed. And Father, we thank you for the many wonderful promise, promises that you have made unto us as a result, a result of that redemption. Now, Father, not just a promise of eternity in heaven, but Father, the promise of a better life here on earth. And Father, for this we give you thanksgiving and praise. We thank you, Father, for these who come out this morning. We ask, Father, for a blessing upon them. 
Lord, that they might have ears to hear, that we all might have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us this morning. Father, we thank you for those who shed the word of who share the word of God around the world, especially Lord, of those who are our missionaries we support in different places. We pray, Father, blessings upon them as they share the word of God with those folks who are there to listen to them. And as usual, Father, we're always thankful for the guardians of our freedom, especially the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, because that's the greatest freedom of all. But, Father, we're also very grateful for our physical freedom, the freedom to live in a country in which we have the liberty and the privileges of worshiping as we best see fit and living our lives as we best see fit. Father, we thank you for those who paid a horrendous price for that freedom. And thank you, Father, for those who are serving even today in all categories here at home and abroad to maintain those wonderful liberties that we enjoy so much. And now, Lord, we would ask that you would bless our time this morning. We pray, Lord, that our thoughts and the meditations of our heart might be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O oh God. And that you might bless us abundantly as the word of God is shared with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Now, I know that we honored somebody for his birthday the first hour, but that was in Spanish. So, Rudy, my 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 big friend, Rudy. <laughs> I think Rudy's probably getting pretty close to 40 now, aren't you? Pretty close. 27. <laughs> All right. Okay. No, now 39 is Jack Benny's age. <laughs> or was it 29? It's 39. Let, let's sing happy birthday to Rudy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rudy. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. And you know you're getting old faster than I am? I'm already old, buddy. Well, that's because there was a time when I was twice as old as you were. And that's well, not true anymore. Up the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Anybody else have a birthday or anniversary we need to remember? Well, of all staters watching, today is his birthday. Well, and happy then, birthday, Al, if you're out there. Two days ago was Arlene. And two days from now is Arlene and Arlene's anniversary. Oh, okay. Happy birthday, Arlene, and happy anniversary, Arlene and uh, and Ernie. Okay, because sometimes they're listening in. So, yes. all right. Uh, anything else we need to? Baptisms. Yes, we got some announcements. Okay, next Sunday, next Sunday, which is July the fourth, we're going to have our baptismal service at, at uh, Paul and Joyce. Um, oh, well, I, I didn't go, go in the old park. That sounds old. Just Paul and Joyce, okay? <laughs> At their swimming pool. And uh, that service will follow our regular English service. We are inviting the Spanish people, people to come to our English service, and we're going to be interpreting it. And I say we are. Uh, Juan's going to be interpreted. You know that, don't you, Juan? I'll, I'll remember, I'll try to give you a copy of the notes so that you can familiarize yourself with what I'm going to have to say. But anyway, it's going to be a message on baptism, and then we will have the baptismal service after that. And then after that, we're going to have a sandwiches, a light lunch. A light lunch. Uh, we'll call it a, they call it the Marine Corps brown bagging. Okay, so everybody bring your little brown bag with your sandwich in it, all right? And uh, that's because we couldn't afford a lunchbox. Uh, they didn't pay us enough to buy a lunchbox, so we had to use a paper sack. I can't complain. Eh? Uh, Ulcers will have drinks and chips. Okay. Um, so, all right. So, there was, and we're going to eat there, too? Yeah, we'll eat there. She's is that right? That oh, Joyce is not here. She makes a decision. No, you don't make those decisions, do you, Paul? She 
yeah. <laughs> okay. That's right. She's up at the lake. This. Okay. All right. Any other announcements? Oh, and then the anniversary will be on uh, the 17th of uh, July instead of the 14th. The 17th is a Saturday. It opens at 5 o'clock. The meal will be served at 6. Now, if you want to make sure you get a plate, be there at 6 because we're only ordering enough plates and somebody might have eaten your plate the time you get there. So be sure to be there at 6. But you can get there as early as 5. It will be open to us at 5. And um, and anyway, we'll have a our there's traditional... Sign-up. Oh, yes. There's a sign-up sheet back in the back, right there back of where Kevin is. And so everybody, be, it, it will have your your last name on it and then just write out there how many people in your family is going to be there. Yeah, that's okay. And, and if, you're, if your children are married, don't count them. Let them count themselves, all right? <laughs> only, only count your, your children that's living at home with you, okay? And you only count one. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don't put three if only two of you are coming, okay? <laughs> Unless you're really, really hungry. Because I know so, in the past we've had to guess at how many to order. And uh, poor old Ishmael had to eat two or three plates sometimes to try to get rid of all that food. <laughs> and, and I heard he I heard him complaining about it, right? So, Child, I had to eat all that food. Oh, okay. It's a, what used to be Embassy Suites, but it's now um, Double, Double Tree. Tree. It's on the Expressway and 2nd Street, uh, well, in Savannah. Second Street and Savannah Street, they're in McAllen, and they. The reason we like it is they give us a private room, and we don't have people going in and out and walking around us and everything, and it's a private room, and uh, and everybody is welcome to come to it, and uh, any other things we need to announce. Um, service tonight will be in First uh, Timothy chapter four. Bible study Tuesday night, John chapter 10, uh, prayer meeting Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. If, if someone has a, a new prayer request, they can call me or text me. And I'll put okay. Uh, Vasha makes out a prayer list, but, you know, unfortunately, we, we don't get communicated sometimes. And so if you have a prayer request, call her. Before before four o'clock on Wednesday, yes. <laughs> because after she runs it off, she don't want to go back and change them again. All right. Any other announcements we need to make? Okay, our next song this morning is number four hundred and eighty-five. Four hundred eighty-five. Revive us again. Let's stand as we sing. <clears throat> We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Spirit of life. Who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All oh, glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain. Who has borne all our sins that has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May his soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again.
Mike, could you do our opener this morning, please? Yes. Do what? <laughs> Y'all may sit down if you want to talk. Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, Father. So many in abundance, Father, we should have made them all. But, Father, you're always mindful of us, all our needs, and all the, Father, all the things that we need to carry on, Father. And thank you for the health and the work that you have provided for us, that we may be able to provide for our families. But Father, also we return what we can with a cheerful heart to you, Lord. But Father, we ask that you receive it and take it, Father, and use it for your honor and your glory. And give us wisdom, Father, to use it where it's used for your word that it may go forward. We love you with thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> You know, several years ago, we were having a meal at, in our house, and another person was there, and when I prayed for the meal, I thanked God for the food. And later this person said to me, why should you thank God for that food? You had to work pretty hard for the money to buy that food with, and you've given him the credit when you really worked hard for that food so the next meal we took i prayed a little bit differently i prayed god thank you for the energy thank you for the wisdom thank you for the talents you have given me to go out and work and make money to buy this food and uh so you know however you look at it we were being thankful to god for the things we eat and uh and you know we we do need to be thankful not just for the food we eat and the water we drink, but how about for the, how many of you ever thank God for the air you breathe? You might remember that when you have trouble breathing sometime and you say, Lord, give me another breath of air. And I can remember sitting on the side of a bed all night, one night, fighting for every breath of air I took. And I had water all on both sides of my lungs and in my lungs. And uh, it was really hard breathing. And I, I was thankful for every, every breath of air I got that night. Okay, our, uh, I had a couple of trivia questions on here for you. Uh, a little on the humorous side. Where did the phrase jumping Jehoshaphat come from? You know, we use that. Uh, so Vashti decided to look it up. Uh, well, in fact, I think first she asked me where it came from, and then she decided to look it up. It was originated here in the United States a couple of hundred years ago, and it was a substitute for slang words. Instead of somebody using profanity, they tried to decide nice and say jump at Jehoshaphat. And, you know, we say like we, we'll say uh, doggone it or something like that. Most of the time those are substitutes for for worser words, okay? If I can use the word worser, uh, for words that are more vulgar. And so we have learned to use substitute profanity. And uh, I once heard a message one time saying that we shouldn't use that substitute profanity at all, and it's probably the right. Okay, uh, how do we know that this phrase is not referring to the seventh king of Israel, whose name was Jehoshaphat? He was the fourth king of Judah. How do we know that's not referring to him? Because he's famous for what God said to him, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Not jump up and down and see the salvation of the Lord, okay? <laughs> All right. Our reading this morning is coming, taken from Ezekiel chapter 14. And we're going to be looking at Nebuchadnezzar. We're talking about people who have, and we talked about Manasseh a couple of weeks ago, who repented of the wrong that he had done and turned to God. And so we're talking about people who have repented and uh, and turned their lives around. And this morning we're going to be talking about Nebuchadnezzar, even though Nebuchadnezzar was not Jewish, he was Gentile, but tremendous story about Nebuchadnezzar. So Ezekiel chapter 14, if you'd please stand with me 
and we'll read these verses which has to do with repentance also. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, And just for the record, in most cases, the repentance in the Old Testament is repenting from idols, okay? And we think about repenting from drinking or smoking or whatever else goes on. But this is repentance mainly from idols, idolatry. Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, stranger and pilgrim in Israel, which separated himself from me, and set up his idols in his heart, and put in the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and he cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning your need. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And it will probably be and they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. That the house of Israel may go no more astray from thee. Neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, says the Lord God. And we see in this passage the whole purpose for divine discipline, or as uh, some pastors have called it, going out to the divine woodshed, and uh, in which God deals with us because of our iniquities, is to turn us away from them and turn us back to to God. Remember the word repent simply means turn around and go the other direction. Okay. And uh, most of us have started off our lives wrong and we did get it turned around and straightened out. Okay. Our next song this morning is number 487. Now I belong to Jesus. I like that first phrase. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. Ever. Do you question that? Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Yes. I hear any amens? Amen. amen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him the power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Once I was lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation. Lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Joy floods my soul, for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he gave to redeem. 
Now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. You may be seated. Look at that last verse again. Joy floods my soul. For Jesus saved me. I hope, folks, that you're just plumb full of joy and happiness this morning because of your salvation. Freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he gave to redeem me. When I went uh, to pick up Rachel during the break a while ago, on the way back, uh, she was slipping through the phone, and uh, she came across this little clip that reads, uh, it shows an airplane. Well, I think it showed an airplane, and it's full of people. And the pilot calls in and says, I'm sorry, folks. Excuse me. I won't see you today because I'm working from home. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. <laughs> well, my point is, I'm, it looks full from up here. I, I'm glad to see it that. It looks nice, doesn't it? Yes, it looks nice. So, um, I mean, anybody out there, I mean, you can come and, and be with us, visit us. So, I mean, it, it's, it's safe now. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you that uh, we can be here this morning, Lord. Thank you for all your wonderful blessings. Lord, I thank you for Chad as he ministered to us. Just bring the words you want him uh, to share with us. Bring him to mind, Lord. And I thank you for every single person that's here today as well, because they uh, ministered to us. And pray for those people out there as well that are watching us on, on, on the camera. Or they minister to us as we minister to them, Lord. And that uh, fills their heart. Uh, to see uh, when the church is full like this. Lord, thank you again for, for Chad, just to be with him, just pray for his health, pray for Vashtis, and just pray for everybody here in general, because I know several of us are hurting. And just uh, thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much, Ishmael. You know, when I was in the, I believe it was the ninth grade, I had a history teacher, world history. Her name was Mrs. Taylor. She was a, a wonderful, wonderful lady, a very quiet-spoken lady. Her husband was a well-known farmer in that area. And uh, she, she could control a classroom better than any other teacher I can remember. Because we had some old boys in our classes who had failed three or four or five times. And some of them were probably close to 20 years old when they got to the 10th grade. And those guys were just a little bit hard to handle. But, you know, Mrs. Taylor could handle them. In her quiet spoken way, she made those guys behave. But anyway, the thing I remember also about Mrs. Taylor is two characters that she taught us. And she taught us about old King Tut and she taught us about a guy named, and she made us learn how to spell this name, Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, and I was really shocked when I first started reading the Bible to find Nebuchadnezzar's name in the pages of my Bible. I only knew Nebuchadnezzar as a man who was in the pages of my history book. And here he shows up in 2 Kings. In Second Chronicles and the book of Daniel. In particular, we find his about his life in the book of Daniel. And so I was excited about running across my old friend Nebuchadnezzar from the ninth grade in Daniel chapters one through one, three, and four, one to four. And so we want to talk to you about Nebuchadnezzar this morning because he was another king who had repented. And he turned to God. And we talked about Manasseh a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was. And uh, he was an Israeli king who had been really, really bad. And, you know, killing people and idolatry and all. But let me assure you, Nebuchadnezzar killed more people than Manasseh ever did. Well, or his armies did. And he worshipped more idols than Manasseh ever did. Nebuchadnezzar was truly... A very wicked heathen king. Although he was very popular in world history. 
After all, he did uh, create one of the seventh wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And they went down in history as one of the seven wonders of the world. So we're going to be looking at Nebuchadnezzar this morning. And I will try my best to see if I can follow that outline that I have in your in your bulletin, at least partially. And we first have found out about Nebuchadnezzar, what in 2 Kings. But I want to read for you from 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 36. 2 Chronicles 36, we find out about him also in 2 Kings verse chapters I think 24 and 25, I believe. It's in two chapters there. But uh, Chronicles gives us a more condensed version of Nebuchadnezzar. Beginning with verse 5. Now, Josiah had been king. And Josiah was a wonderful king who had brought about a great revival for the land of Judah. But then Josiah was killed uh, by the king of Egypt. And so then... His son took the the uh, the reign. Now Josiah was very unusual because he had three sons and one grandson who reigned as king. All the rest of them only had one son who reigned as king. But Josiah had three sons and one grandson who reigned as kings, and they all had the same reputation. They were all evil. Josiah was an absolutely wonderful man, and all of his descendants were evil. Does that tell us something, people? Does that tell us that we can't make the decision for our children whether they walk with God or not? They have to make it themselves. It is up to us to influence them to make the right decisions, the wise decision, right? But anyway, we find out that all of Josiah's sons were evil. Look at in, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 5. Joachim was 20 and five years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, Jehoiakim was the second king after Josiah. Je Jehoahaz was the first one, and then he was replaced by the king of Egypt, and Jehoiakim was put in his place. And in verse 6, against him came up, there he is, Nebuchadnezzar, first mention of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Chronicles, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters and carried him to Babylon. So here we see that Nebuchadnezzar came and took away uh, the, the king of Judah. By the way, he didn't take just uh, Jehoiakim. He also took Daniel. Now, I've got the Babylonian's name. I can't remember the Israel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's a Babylonian's name. Michelle, Azariah, and somebody else. Anyway, but I always learned them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Begin, though, which is a Babylonian thing. What was Daniel's Babylonian name? Bel Bel Belshazzar. Belshazzar. No, no, Bel Belteshazzar. Belshazzar became king later. It was Belteshazzar. By the way, those names all came from Nebuchadnezzar's gods. He renamed those boys. After his God, you see, Nebuchadnezzar took these four boys and probably some others as well, because Nebuchadnezzar's idea of ruling Judah was to train the people who would run the country for him. And so he took these young men who were all of the king's seed. That means they were all related to the king. And he brought them to Babylon and put them in his school to retrain them to think like he thinks. And then he was going to have them go back to Judah and run the country for him. His plan didn't work out so well. Uh, for one thing, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't want to eat the, the rich meat that Nebuchadnezzar offered, and they chose to eat vegetables. They were vegetarians, I guess. And they chose to eat vegetables, and God blessed them and caused them to be healthy-looking than all the others who ate the king's meats. But anyway, you read in chapter 1 about uh, about these young men. And when Nebuchadnezzar examined them after they finished their school, he was shocked to find out that these four Jewish boys were wiser than all the other guys he was training. And so he was quite impressed with them. So this is God's first witness to Nebuchadnezzar. It's just these four Jewish boys who turned out so good. Now, God's second witness to Nebuchadnezzar 
would would come in um, in in Daniel chapter two. By the way, that, that first uh, paragraph we had uh, a Nebuchadnezzar. He destroyed millions of God's people, and he destroyed the city. He destroyed God's temple. He was truly a wicked, wicked king. All right, but he's gonna he's gonna change. Hang on. And so we look in, in Daniel chapter two, and we find out the first of Daniel's dreams. Now, chapter one it has to do with their education. Chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And uh and anyway, he uh he wondered what the dream was all about, so he called all of his wise men, his magicians, his soothsayers, all his hocus pocus people, had them all come in and uh, would y'all please tell me about my dream? And they said, well, what was the dream? He said, well, I'm not going to tell you. He says, if you're near as smart as you think you are, you could tell me what I dreamed. Well, that put a different shoe on the foot, right? <laughs> and uh, so they couldn't tell him. They said, well, we can't tell you what you dreamed if you don't tell us what the dream is. Nebuchadnezzar says, I know you're going to lie to me if I tell you what the dream is. You're going to give me any old interpretation you dream of. He said, but to prove that you're really so smart, you tell me the dream and then tell me the interpretation. They couldn't do it. Nebuchadnezzar said, all right, off with the head. Slay the whole bunch of them. And so anyway, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Dan, Rack, Dan Rack, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, Danrak and other three guys. Okay. They, uh, they also were included in these people that were going to be destroyed. And Daniel said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, come on, hold on a minute now. Let's think this over. Says, uh, maybe there is somebody that could tell the the king what his dream was. And so Daniel came up and he says, I can't tell you what the dream is, but God can. And says, my God is going to show me what you dream. And sure enough, God showed Daniel what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. And Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was about. If you remember, it was that image, head of gold, uh, chest of silver. Stomach of uh, brass and legs of iron, feet of clay. And what? Clay and iron mix. Uh, what? Clay and iron mix. All right, clay, clay and iron mix. It. And uh, anyway, what it was, that dream was a vision of what Jesus called the age of the Gentiles. Nebuchadnezzar was the first king in the age of the Gentiles. And the age of the Gentiles will go all the way down till Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation period. To establish his earthly kingdom. And so all this time that we're living in now. It's called the age of the Gentiles. The Gentiles are ruling the world. And not the Jews. The Jews have been set aside. Okay. Because of their. Mainly because of the rejection of Christ. So anyway. Daniel interpreted this dream. And Nebuchadnezzar got his second good. Uh, view of God. Because Wow. Who could show you this dream unless it truly was a real, real, honest to goodness God? And so, therefore, Nebuchadnezzar changed his opinion about that Daniel's God. Your God is, what did he say? Nebuchadnezzar says, your God is greater than my gods. But Nebuchadnezzar continued to worship his idols, by the way. But anyway, he was recognizing the God of Dan, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the God, the God of Israel, of course. And then in chapter 3, uh, Nebuchadnezzar set up another idol. Now, we don't know what this idol is, but there's been a lot of speculation made. We know the idol is kind of a strange-looking one because it's very tall and not very wide. And uh, so it doesn't look like a real image, but a lot of people think that it was a, a tall pole and it had an image of Nebuchadnezzar on top of it. And he wanted the people to worship it. Others think that it was an image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream was on the top of it. We don't know. We just know that Nebuchadnezzar set it up. And he says, I want everybody to worship this idol that I have set up. And, of course, you know, we, we don't know about Daniel in that chapter. But we know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, we're not going to worship. We're not going to fall down and worship that image. That's just not the thing we do. Now, somebody always wondered, well, what did Daniel do? Daniel, Daniel didn't worship either. He was probably busy about the king's business, and he didn't have to stand out there in public and be made uh, a part of that, that um, 
those people that worship it. Anyway, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar got his third great revelation of God. He looked in there, and by the way, the, the furnace evidently was a, 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 a brick, brick plan kiln, and it was open on the top, and uh, but it had a opening door in front where you put the bricks and stuff in there. And so anyway, they threw these three guys in there, and it, the fire was so hot, it killed the people that threw them in. And old Nebuchadnezzar got back there, and he looked down inside of there, and he got back where it wasn't hot, so hot. And he says, I see four people in there. How many do we throw in? Three. Why do I see four? And, uh, and so he determined that one of them was the son of God. And so they brought the three guys out. And sure enough, there was only three guys in there. But uh, there was evidently somebody in there with them. And uh, that would have been, this, as Nebuchadnezzar said himself, the son of God. So that was Nebuchadnezzar's third great revelation of who God is. And then all this happened within the very first part of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Because his reign and the time that Daniel went to Babylon began at the same time. And Daniel became Nebuchadnezzar's right-hand man. He was elevated to the highest position, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also elevated to high positions. But Daniel became uh, Nebuchadnezzar's most trusted friend. So then we go along on through the, uh, the second attack on Jerusalem, which was in 597 B.C., and then the third attack, which is in 586 B.C., and that was when the temple and the city was destroyed, and the people were all killed, and uh, except for the ones that were taken back uh, for slavery. So now it's my guess is that this event happens after that, because it's probably in the later part of, of Nebuchadnezzar's life, and uh, lost my thought there just a minute. But uh, anyway. Nebuchadnezzar has another dream, okay? Now, we're going to look at this dream in a little bit more in detail. Now, we saw the hardiness of Nebuchadnezzar when he made that idol and made those everybody worship him. And then we see his hardiness also in chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all peoples, nations, and languages that dwelt in all the earth, peace be multiplied in you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the uh, the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs and his mighty, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, verse 4 I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my, in my palace. Nebuchadnezzar says, Man, I have, I have ruled a good reign. He was king from, uh, for probably, uh, close to 30 years, and he says, As I've built this beautiful city of Babylon. I've done all these wonderful things. I'm going to just sit back and take it easy now. And this is what I have done. Now, in this dream, he's going to tell us about it. Nebuchadnezzar, now these, these are Nebuchadnezzar's words, which God has given to him in verses 1 down through 4. Now, in verse 5, it's going to start telling us about his dream. Now, we don't have time to sit and read through the whole dream and the interpretation and everything. If you haven't never read it, I would invite you to read it. You might find it very interesting. Now, I'm just going to sort of relate it to you. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, this time, he doesn't expect his magicians to figure out what he dreamed. He tells them. And then they're afraid to give him the interpretation. They may have understood the interpretation, but they thought, man, if we tell him what this what we understand this dream to mean, we're going to lose our heads. And so they told him they didn't understand, okay? And uh, so anyway, never going to have this dream. The dream was a great tree, very high, great limbs, the birds sat in the tree, animals under the shade, fantastic tree, fantastic tree, the mightiest in the, in the whole area. And then as Nebuchadnezzar continued in his dream, a person called a watcher, which would have been an angel probably, 
popped up and says, chop down the tree. So they chopped down the tree. But he says, leave the stump and put a band of, of um, I, mean, I think it was bronze, put a band of bronze around it and leave the stump there. And, uh, and that was the dream. And these wise men thought, there's no way we're going to tell him what we think that dream means. Because that tree is obviously was Nebuchadnezzar. And to have it chopped down, you know, hey, king, hey, sorry about this. Man, you fixing to get it. Somebody's going to chop you down to size. By the way, somebody was going to chop him down to size. Who was it? God himself was going to chop him down to size. And so Daniel, he told Daniel the dream. And Daniel was astonished for an hour before he answered. And then Daniel's first comment to him was, I wish this dream was for your enemies and for those who hate you. And then he proceeded to tell him the dream about the tree being chopped down and all the animals fleeing from it, and the birds leaving and everything. But then Daniel went on to say, that the the, uh, the tree, no, excuse me, that was the end of the dream, okay? So it, then uh, Nebuchadnezzar rewarded Daniel because he interpreted the dream. But then Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar some advice. It's in verse, uh, what is it, 27, 30, it's verse 34. In verse 34, Nebuch he gives Nebuchadnezzar some advice. He says, uh, no, that's not that's not the right one. I wanted uh, oh here verse 27. Verse 27 is his counsel. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be accepted unto thee. Break off thy sins by righteousness and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. And so Daniel's advice to him is, never blesser. God's wanting you to repent and fly straight, and then God will bless you for it. Now, remember, Nebuchadnezzar had four, well, had three great revelations of God already. And this is his fourth opportunity. And Nebuchadnezzar does not respond properly. Because properly. we look, verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the, uh, for the, house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Just look what I've done. And Nebuchadnezzar, I, we would say he was pretty full of himself at this point. Is this not great Babylon that I have built? How majestic am I? And uh, and then what does it say? Verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. The tree is being chopped down. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling place shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, and thou shalt know. Now look at this. Thou shalt know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men, and give it to whomsoever he will. God is saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you're not in charge. I am. And I am going to show you. And he's saying, and after I show you, you're going to recognize that I am in charge. You remember going back to the to the ten plagues in Egypt? What was the purpose of every one of those plagues? That never that that the that Pharaoh might know that I am the Lord. And it says that about those plagues. Well, not only Pharaoh, but also the other people as well might know that I am the Lord. And so why is God bringing Nebuchadnezzar down? 
so that Nebuchadnezzar might know who God is. Now, Eddie talked about the prodigal son first hour. And the prodigal son did not really know who his father was until he ended up in the pig pen. And then he came back in humility to his father and said, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Could I have a job as one of your slaves? You see, he was brought back different than he went out. I, I had never thought about it this morning. But I, he didn't say, Father, please give me my share of the inheritance. He says, give me my share of the inheritance. See the arrogancy there? See the arrogancy in King Nebuchadnezzar? Okay. And then we go on through the story. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, he becomes insane. He is put out to pasture for seven years. He eats grass. He lives outside. His hair becomes real coarse and is uh, it's not almost like eagle feathers, it says. And he was he went nuts. And uh, instead of keeping him in the palace, they kept him outside. I got a question for you. All right. Now, the king has gone nuts. So what's going to happen to the kingdom? Daniel. Huh? Daniel. Yes. Daniel. Daniel ran the kingdom for seven years while Nebuchadnezzar was out to pasture. Why? If he hadn't, somebody else would have taken it over. But Daniel had enough authority that he took over and he ran that kingdom. It doesn't say that. But he ran that kingdom for seven years, no doubt in my mind about it. Because why? Otherwise, it would not have been there when Nebuchadnezzar came back. Okay? So, uh, so but notice what Nebuchadnezzar says. He says, look down at verse 34. And in the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes, where? Unto heaven. And mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. It took Nebuchadnezzar seven years to learn a hard lesson. But he learned it. By the way, it took him longer than that. It took him ever since he, yeah. ever since he was born until what? What was it? Maybe he's here sixty years old by now. But he's finally got his eyes open. He's finally beginning to realize that guess what? I am not the 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 biggest guy on the totem pole. Is that, that's not a good expression either, is it? <laughs> anyway, I'm not the biggest guy here. There's somebody here bigger than me and uh, and this is what god wanted nebuchadnezzar to learn nebuchadnezzar you're a fine king by the way all the things that nebuchadnezzar did who told him to do them god did that is amazing god sent nebuchadnezzar to jerusalem to destroy it he sent him to tyre to destroy it he sent him to england to, to england to uh -huh. egypt <laughs> he might have said in england too to egypt to destroy it he sent him to assyria to destroy it God sent him to all those places to do that. And he was going to punish him for doing that. And what? And he was going to punish him for doing that. And, and by the way, his reward for destroying Tyre was the nation of Egypt. God says, I'm going to give you Egypt because you did what I asked you to do. And you see, God called Nebuchadnezzar my servant. Mm -hmm. But Nebuchadnezzar was not part of the family of God. Okay. I, I was told when I was in Bible school that God doesn't use unsafe people. I disagreed. Uh -huh. I says, God uses lots of unsaved people. And God used Nebuchadnezzar tremendously before Nebuchadnezzar ever came to salvation. God, God used, thank you. That was you, Ishmael. How'd you know that? <laughs> God uses the devil. He sure does. The devil don't like it, but God uses him anyway. All right? So anyway, uh, so we see Nebuchadnezzar... He's restored. His sanity is given back to him. We'll go down to verse 37. And here's his final comment here. Now I, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. 
all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride he is able to abase and he's referring to himself yeah he says i have just been taken to the divine woodshed for seven years but well, now i'm brought out and now i'm part of the family of god my history book didn't have this story in it i just went on thinking that nebuchadnezzar was just another great king i had no idea here ever become a godly man but he became humbled by god and god restored him to his kingdom restored him to his authority and blessed him and nebuchadnezzar confessed god as being the king of kings and lords of lords there, there's a image later on in which daniel sees these different images and he sees this beast and uh, there's a beast and god gave the beast a new heart and that beast is symbolic of nebuchadnezzar and why did god give that beast a new heart because he gave nebuchadnezzar a new heart a born-again heart nebuchadnezzar became a new man because god took him to the divine woodshed now i'm I'm sure I'm not the only one that's been out to the divine woodshed. I have been there and probably some of you have too. Um, and for the most part, we've learned our lessons, haven't we? And you see what God was saying to Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to deal with you very roughly until you learn a tremendous lesson. And that lesson is I am the one in charge you know we like to say that well you know i'll wear the pants in my family uh, god says wait a minute i'll wear the pants in your family if you're truly a christian family you are not in charge you are the second in charge no no your wife's not number one either okay <laughs> god is number one in charge if you are a christian family don't forget that that little song that was popular here years ago and uh this guy was expressing his love for this girl and she was telling him he says you can never have first place in my life she says you can only have second place she says because god has first place and you see we need to recognize that in our family god has first place we simply bring up a distant second and I say distant because we're a long ways away from where God runs the show. Look down at the bottom of the page, and I put down some verses there you're all very familiar with. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, now this is after Solomon dedicated the temple, and he, in his prayer of dedication, he prayed, you know, if we get carried away captivity and we pray towards this building, restore us. If we uh, suffer disease, we pray to this building, and you restore us. If we suffer hunger, we pray to this building and you'll feed us on and on. And then God met with King Solomon in chapter 7. And God told him this, if my people, which are called by my name, see the first thing that happens, shall humble themselves. Humble themselves. And pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. God says, I'm listening. I'm listening. But but I want you to be sure to notice the pattern there. Humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from the wicked ways. God says, then I'll listen to you. You know, we uh, we sometimes think that, and, and by the way, God hears all of our prayers. But there's a, there's a hearing and then there's a hearing, okay? God hears all of your prayers. But how about, which ones does he consider? And that's the ones that prayed after the humble heart and the repentance and the seeking of my faith. God says, those are the ones I really consider. And I think about 
all the little prayers I used to pray when I was a kid growing up. And, uh, you know, I, I'd see a girl that I like, and I'd pray God to give me that woman, that girl for my wife. And I look back and I say, thank God you didn't. <laughs> From what I've seen of some of them since then, thank God you didn't get me that, that woman after all, you know. But all the things that we ask God for, we'd pray and ask God for a job and we wouldn't get it. We couldn't understand. God, why didn't I get that job? God says, well, I didn't want you to have it. Why? God says, because I know best. I know best. And uh, I can remember praying for a guy for a job one time. And he got it. And he's still doing it. You have, how many years, Kevin? 39. 39 years. And we sat down here in, in Marvin Nestor's house and prayed for that job. And he got it. And uh, 39 years. My goodness. That's almost long enough to retire. Right, right there, aren't you? All right. So what we want to see is the importance of written wit of repentance in the divine cycle of coming to salvation. Folks, don't leave out repentance. Turn, turn, turn from that horrible direction you're headed in. Turn from your evil ways. Did any of us have evil ways? I won't tell you mine if you won't tell me yours, okay? And I don't want to hear about your evil ways, and I don't want you to hear about mine either, okay? But God's first call was for us to turn away from that and to turn to him. You can't follow God if you're following the world. Amen. God's over here. The world's over here. You can't follow both of them because you can't go two directions. Amen. You either got to follow the world or turn around and follow God. That's what repentance is all about. And are we in the world? Yes, we are in the world. Do we have to work in the world? Yes, we have to work in the world. Do we have to feed our families? Yes, we have to feed our families. God has nothing kind to say about a man that doesn't take care of his families. Fact is, he says, God says he's worse than an infidel. He doesn't take care of his family. So we need to work to take care of our family. That's part of God's design. But we don't follow the world. We follow God. Okay. Anybody got a comment or something they would like to add to what we talked about? Nebuchadnezzar is a tremendous, tremendous example of a person who is true to repentant. Uh, and you, like I said, you can find that story. And yes, ma'am. Mike and I were having coffee yesterday morning already in the patio, and uh, we were talking about repentance. And I said, "Well, you know, I want to hear you." Oh, oh. <laughs> Okay, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead and tell us. No, no, we were talking out there, and um, um, I said, you know, we, we have to get a hold of our children very young. Yes, you do. Teach them God's word because my life was, oh, you know, um, go get it and, and just do world stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can say most of them were good because I'm not in prison. Good. All right. <laughs> uh, and I apologized to my husband. I said, you know, if, if I would have known the Lord before we got married, I think that we would have more. And well, more, sure. And we would have God's stuff. You know, and I wouldn't be number one in our relationship. <laughs> but uh, we need to take, we need to hold on to, we need to teach our children. I, I think about those wasted years because I didn't come to the Lord until I was in my early 30s, 32, I think. And, uh, you know, why couldn't I come to the Lord when I was 15? How much better off I would have been, right? Uh, but, you know, I I know people didn't come to the Lord. Well, I, my friend Paul Patchen came to the Lord at the age of 55. And, boy, I mean, he was a changed man. And, uh, tremendous the last few years of his life and uh so many other people come uh, god can take us whenever so he'd rather take us young so but sometimes those people when i was in dallas school in bible college all the case caretaker of a 91 year old man who's german actually world war ii in the german side and uh he came to know all these days uh -huh. but that guy read the whole bible i mean that guy was in love with jesus you know and sometimes when you come older, because you already lived your life in the world, you get a great appreciation for God. That's true, because great, 
you, you see your salvation as being a greater experience than, than yeah. someone who came at 15. Yeah. I remember what Frida told me one time, and she says, you know, I, I became a Christian at a very, very young age, and so I didn't have all that evil yeah. that other people have gone through. And she says, uh, but she says, let me assure you, I don't want to go back and start start my life later like I did. Yeah. But uh, because she says, but I'm thankful that I didn't have to go through that. But she says, I can understand the deeper appreciation you people yeah. have of salvation because uh, you were saved from a deeper a deeper pit. Can I say? Yeah. Uh, Psalm 40, verse one, what, two and three, right? He brought me up also out of a yeah. out of Maori pit. And uh, out of my clay, and uh, set my feet upon a rock. By the way, that rock is Christ. Yeah. Huh? And put a new song in my mouth. Huh? And put a new song in my mouth. And, the last part of that. and that's right. Put a new song in my mouth. And many shall hear it and shall turn to the Lord. Yeah, and James 4 4 brothers says, uh, Friend of the world, enemy of God. We don't have to do with God. And it's true. We cannot and it's true. When we become close to God, unfortunately, uh, we become separated from Jesus says, I come to separate no. family members. Some will respond to them and some won't. And and you always still love our family members that don't, but guess what? Uh, they're not part of the family of God. Unfortunately. Any other comments? Well, I, well I oh boy, I'm... we went over time. Six minutes. Uh -oh. You went over time this morning. Yes. <laughs> Not as much as you. Oh. <laughs> oh. Let's stand when we dismiss. Why are you back there? Yes. Let us hear from you, sir. Father, once again, we thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Father, we thank you for the message that we heard from the book of Daniel, Father. And uh, for uh, the transformation that Nebuchadnezzar brings on because uh, of uh, a new work in, in through his life. And uh, Father, we pray that we will do the same. Father, we repent before then we get to this kind, kind of situation, Father. Thank you for each person that is here. We ask that you receive a uh, blessing, Father, from this word. And also guide us as we travel back home safely this afternoon, Father. And, once again, we thank you for the liberty that we have to hear your word here in, the, in this country, Father. Once again, Father, we thank you with the praying Christ. Amen. 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 Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>